So picking up on <coughs> capital investment and the role of savings in the economy, uh, this is a part two. Last video, we talked about the hockey stick curve and what <coughs> causes an economy to grow. Now I want to show uh, and talk about a few more examples of these things. Uh, and this is sort of a joke, but there's a show, or was a show, I don't know if it's on, they make new episodes of it on TLC, a learning channel, uh, called Extreme Cheapskates. And this is kind of a fun show to watch. I show an episode of it <clears throat> in class to look at the, you know, what are they giving up by being extreme cheap skates? What are they getting out of it? You know, your subjective value, but also just talking about the, the role of, of savings. And these people do it in a way that's kind of uh, maybe outlandish or extreme or weird. Um, but it, it gets us thinking about the role of savings. Why is saving so important? How does this, how does saving cause an economy to grow because <clears throat> a modern narrative is that an economy needs to be stimulated and if you take money and move it around to other sectors of the economy and people spend it that that will stimulate the economy and in a sense it will it'll stimulate some parts of the economy at the expense of others the problem with that is if we follow that through logically, if, if spending is what causes growth and you can spend yourself into wealth, you probably already recognize the logical issue just by my using that expression, that if everybody follows that, somebody buys a shirt, that person gets the money from selling the shirt. Now they take that money, they spend, you know, on whatever they want. People keep spending, spending, spending. Eventually, the wealth of an economy diminishes from that. Uh, the only known way in history, the only known way in economic history of the world that increases overall wealth and standard of living, not just the wealth of some at the expense of others, Not we're not talking about exploitation, but we're the only known way to grow an economy is through savings, an increased pool of saving in the present for the future that causes people to move forward and get ahead. People save and then have money to a little bit more money in the future because they are in the present because they saved in the past and then they save again and that process doubles and then they have money to uh or resources doesn't have to be money it could be time could be any of these things that save them in the future and then they invest in tools they invest in things that make them more productive they invest in producing things so we're going to look at uh, examples of what are called capital goods and through the investment in those things, those tools that make people more productive, the economy grows. The, not only the, that individual's standard of living, but everyone that they're interacting with. And then those people, their standard of living goes up and it causes another cycle of savings as well. This is a carrot harvester. Now I want you to imagine you're in this field and of carrots. Okay, now it took labor and work to, to plant the carrots in the first place. But I want to, you to imagine that your job is you have to go through by hand and pick these carrots. So this would take an extreme amount of labor, an extreme amount of time, an extreme amount of resources. Another option is that you invest, you spend on a shovel or some sort of tool that will help you be more productive. Now, with that shovel, you can do more than you could do by hand. You've, inve you've invested in a capital good. A capital good is the shovel. Uh, most people don't buy shovels as like a consumer good just because they think they're cool to have. It's because they help them produce something else. Capital goods are the stuff that makes stuff. And so 
this tool is invested in, it has a cost, it has maintenance, it can break. The more you use it, the more likely it is to, to wear out and things like this. So there is a cost in doing that. But in giving up something in the present to get that shovel, you're doing a benefit to your future self because you're now taking the savings, the sacrifice in the present, and you're pushing the benefits onto yourself in the future because now, next time, you have the shovel and you're able to continue using it, using it, using it, being more productive. Same principle with this kind of tractor here that's a carrot harvester. That the investment in this is going to be costly. It's going to take maintenance to uh, keep this up, things on a break. Uh, it takes a, an amount of saving and sacrifice and money to purchase something like this in the first place. Somebody had to take the time to invent this, to get the materials, to put it together, to go through different iterations to see what worked, and then sell it to uh, other people. And now a farmer purchases this, and you can see the difference between uh, farmer A and farmer B. Let's say farmer A says, I'm not going to waste my money on buying a carrot harvester when I can just pick carrots by hand and I don't have to give up any money. And that's true. Farmer B, though, says, but by sacrificing now in the present, I could get this carrot harvester that's going to make me more productive. It's going to save me time, labor, energy, resources, and therefore eventually save me money and by investing in this tool, I can plow a larger amount of carrots than I could otherwise doing it by hand. So farmer B sees that it's worth it, farmer A doesn't. So in the present, farmer A, uh, farmer B gives something up and for a little while it is poorer than farmer A. He sacrifices. But that sacrifice is actually going to move him ahead. And that's what the investment, the savings, that's how saving grows in an economy. That's how the savings creates a pool of, uh, of available resources from which people can loan to create businesses, get money back from those things, continue to save. But it all takes uh, an incredible amount of uh, sacrifice in the present in order to benefit the future. And it has this uh, exponential effect, as is shown from the hockey stick graph. Uh, on here is attached a video of the carrot harvester, which I'm not going to play, but you can see this uh, pulling the carrots out of the ground, knocking the dirt off them, cleaning them, cutting uh, the uh, top part off here, and placing it in uh, a bin to be collected. Uh, this is an example of. Uh, another capital good, this individual uh, in this episode of the show called The Profit, which is kind of like Shark Tank, except this uh, investor, Marcus Limonis, goes to them. He invests in the company. He has a stake in it, so therefore he has a say, and he helps them uh, kind of revamp their companies or save their company. He's working with this bagel shop that makes bagels and different pastries and breads and things of this nature. And anyway... What's kind of cool to watch in this video is this uh, business owner purchased at one time a bagel making machine. So you throw the ingredients in, it mixes up all this dough and, and all this stuff and creates all these things. Uh, and, and then you take the dough and you throw it in and it molds the dough, brings it into little balls, rolls the dough, cuts it shapes the dough into the bagel form and then brings it up on uh, on a tray and then those uh, bagels are formed uh, not formed they're they're uh, cooked they're baked they're fried and made into that uh, bagel to be purchased now who would buy a bagel making machine now this isn't a bagel making machine like for houses for like making huge amounts of bagels well, this is 
could be a consumer good if people were just interested in a bagel making machine, but this is more of a capital good. It's a tool. It's something that helps you produce something else. Now, to do that, this business owner had to give up money. He had to give up resources. He had to give up possibly time. But the hope of this investment is that it's going to save him those things in the future, making him more productive, making him not have to pay as much for labor, making him any labor that he does use or pay uh, more efficient and saving him money so that the prices can be brought down. He can be more competitive. The quality can be brought up. This only has uh, benefits to it. And so this is investment in capital goods. This is why saving is so important. Here's another uh, example of this from kind of popular culture. Cast Away is a film with Tom Hanks where he goes, uh, he crash lands as a FedEx, uh, FedEx employee on a plane. He crash lands on a desert island and he has to survive. And then he eventually tries to get off the island. But this is a kind of you know famous movie. It's pretty long, but it's good. And he goes and, and lands on the island. And it has a lot of uh, economic uh, teaching moments. But on that, you know, he was living a pretty good life before. He was pretty wealthy in terms of his overall standard of living. But now on the island, he is dirt poor. He has nothing, literally, except what his own hands can make. And so this shows that we often take for granted that we benefit from all the investments of the past, the division of labor that we have that's pretty extreme, that gives us the, the wealth and the standard of living that we currently enjoy in the modern world. That we don't think about the fact that if we went back to, to nothing, just our bare hands, what could we do? What would we have to do to survive? So he has to use his time, labor, resources very strategically because time is going to get cold. It's going to get dark. He's going to need fire. But as he's doing all these things, every move he makes literally is burning calories. He's going to need food. He's going to need supplies. He's going to need some type of clothing and shelter. And at one point, he before he goes on this uh, this trip he gets on the plane where he ends up crash landing. He has a problem with his tooth and his plan is, oh, okay, I'll go to the dentist after Christmas. Well, obviously when he crash lands, that plan is out, but his problem, he still has a tooth that's giving him issues. And so he doesn't have the capital investment of people who have invested in the knowledge, the training, the machines, the tools, of modern dentistry the, and the division of labor that someone else can be an expert in dentistry and he doesn't have to and he can just pay them for their services so he has to go back to very primitive dentistry and so throughout the movie there's different things that wash up on the shore that came from the plane because it was delivering uh, packages and one of the things he finds that becomes a fairly useful tool to him in many ways is ice skate blade and so he takes the blade off his ice skate and uses it to extract a tooth. Now, this is one of the reasons why you can imagine the investment, the capital investment of the past on which we all free ride benefits the modern world. We don't have to rediscover electricity and recreate it and harness it and create the light bulb and all this stuff every generation. We don't have to uh, restart every time we want to use shampoo. We don't have to go out and get the materials to put together shampoo, put together the bottle and all this stuff to hold it and harness it ourselves. Somebody else has done that. We trade with them. It's a division of labor, but it's also investment. People have invested in the knowledge, the tools, the resources, the industries to be able to do those things. That's why investments and even things we don't, um, well, some people do if they like sewing, but things like the sewing machine that literally revolutionized the world in the ability to be able to sew things together in a way that was more efficient by using a machine. Uh, Survivor is the same thing, same concept. People go from living in what we would consider kind of in the American West, 
pretty normal life, and then they go to being dirt poor on this island and have to survive. They have to think very strategically about their resources uh, and, and decide. They have to make decisions on whether or not what resources they're going to invest in. Uh, economist Ludwig von Mises said that every single performance in the ceaseless pursuit of wealth production is based upon the saving and preparatory work of earlier generations. And his point in saying that was that the savings of the past create the wealth of the present and future. And the savings of the present also, presumably not all other things being equal, creates the wealth of the future. That it's through saving, it's through investment, it's through making sacrifices, it's through making strategic decisions to give up in the past that cause people to not have to give up in the present as much and benefited them in the present and the future. So this caused the investment in capital goods. Once present wants are satisfied, we start to think about our future needs. So once we have what we want or need in the present time, we start to think a little bit more long term. So if we're able to set it, satisfy present wants and needs, hunger, clothing, shelter, those basic things, we'll start to think about what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about a few months from now? What about a year? What about a few years from now? And so people begin to save part of what they would consume now to use it later. This is a judgment call that we often make, and it's subjective. There's nothing morally wrong with or right about either one. <clears throat> but it's a decision we make all the time about now and later. Do I want to have something now or do I want to have something later? It's There's uh, the decision between instant gratification and delayed gratification. There's the decision, usually as it is, would I rather have less now or more later? Now, sometimes it's the same amount, but I'd rather have this this amount now or this exact same amount later. But they're kind of different in the sense that they're, they're really different things. The saving means that you get to have more later by definition. So saving is the first step on the way toward the improvement of material well-being. This is how material well-being increases in the world, is through saving, through that investment, in the future, this uh, the sacrifice in the present. <clears throat> this is done on the basis of what is called time preference. Time preference limits saving and investing in the in the future. Now, why do some people want or need to spend money now, and others want or need to spend money later? Well, this has to do with the economic uh, idea of time preference, which I'm going to explain. Would you rather have less money now or more money later, or more money? now and less money later okay so by saving now that means by definition i will have more in the future than i otherwise would have if i didn't save. by consuming now i by definition will have less in the future so we make decisions based on our individual time preference with regard to these different things we decide sometimes to forgo something now so that we can have more of it later. Or we decide I need or want something now, so I'm going to give up having more of that thing later. So time preference, this is how it works with loans. This is how it makes loans or something like loans, but it really applies to everything. But loans is an example of how uh, this makes it possible. Otherwise, we would just continue saving uh, all the time because we would never have uh, the need to have something in the present. So low time preference is willing to put off consumption in the present for greater consumption in the future. High time preference is willingness to put off consumption in the future for greater consumption in the present. Now, which one of these high time preference or low time preference will accept a loan? I think carefully about this. Low time preference means willing, uh, and which one will give a loan, okay? Low time preference means willing to put off consumption in the presence for greater consumption in the future. High time preference 
means willing to put off consumption in the future for greater consumption in the present. And both of these individuals can trade alone because they see in it their mutual advantage in one person getting something now, one person getting something later, even if it's kind of the same good. So the low time preference would be the person or the individual or the institution willing to give a loan. They're willing to give up money now to let someone borrow it, okay, at interest. That's what a loan is, unless it's a charitable loan. So giving a loan at interest to somebody else that I'll give up the money I could be spending now because I'd rather have the benefit of more money in the future. High time preference uh, person, and this is not one's better or worse than the other, this is just what makes loans possible, and it's an example of time preference. A high time preference is willing to put off consumption in the future for greater consumption in the present. So they will accept a loan because in their mind, they want or need that money right now in the present. So they need the money in the present. The low time preference wants the money in the future. The high time preference wants the money in the present. So they want the loan to be able to do something. And they recognize that they, by using the money in the present, will have to pay off the original amount of money plus more, the interest of money in the future. They will have to pay it back. So that's what a loan is. Uh, and that's how high time preference, low time preference works. Now, throughout the past and throughout history, people had to make decisions with very little resources at near starvation levels. They had to make low time preference decisions. By giving up in the uh, present, they and others experienced greater benefits in the future. And so this is. Uh, what began to grow and the economy, the standard of living, and the material well-being. We close by talking about this uh, cartoon. Now, I didn't invent this cartoon of how this uh, how an economy grows, but I borrowed it. Uh, and I think it was created by Peter Schiff or his father. But anyway, uh, so imagine you crash land. I'm just going to talk through it. I'm not going to read the comment. Imagine you crash land on a desert island, you and some friends, and you are able to just get enough to survive. You go fishing with your friends with your hands uh, every day, and as you're fishing, you're able to catch just enough fish to eat and survive, and the food's able to sustain you until the next day when you catch that fish again and follow through on the same process. Okay, so <clears throat> people can see that they're eating the fish, but uh, this guy recognizes by doing this, we're never going to grow. We're never going to get past this poverty level because we consume everything that is produced. Everything that is produced gets consumed. So even though our labor, <clears throat> uh, our time, our resources are used to catch those fish. We've produced fish, but then we consume everything that we produce. There's no investment. There's no savings. There's no buildup of credit uh, by doing this. So we're stuck at this poverty level. <clears throat> so he starts to think, and he imagines the concept of a net or a fishing pole. Okay. But at this point, it's just an idea. Now, he's expended some thought in coming up with this, this idea, <clears throat> but nothing's happened yet. The next day, he has a choice. And it's a very uh, difficult choice, possibly, because the choice is this. You can go fishing and continue to catch your fish and eat them, but whatever is produced gets consumed. There's no opportunity for growth. Or you can not fish and try to build your idea for a net, but 
the time, the energy, the labor, the resources that are used to build a net means that you are having to give up producing in a sense. You're having to give up the, the production that you are familiar with and know is going to feed you. And so he's having to give up these things in order to produce and, and take an incredible risk on a fishing device that may not even work, that may be a waste. And if he fails, he's wasted a whole day of fishing. He's wasted hours of time that he can't get back. He's wasted resources. He's wasted calories. So it's a pretty tough decision. So he decides not to go fishing with his friends, but to spend the day putting together this net. So this is self-sacrifice. Now he goes the next day with the net and is able to catch more fish. So now his net pays off. <clears throat> though there's upkeep, though there was there were costs, though he had to give up things, he's now able to catch more fish, less time, less energy, and he's able to take that time, the time, energy, labor, and resources that he was spending uh, fishing normally, and now since he's able to do more with less because of his tool, he's able to free up his time. He's able to free up his labor. He's able to free up his resources now to do other things. Maybe he makes another net. Maybe he builds a fire. Maybe he builds more shelter. Maybe he finds some other productive way to do things. Now, now he's engaging in this cycle of savings and investing all over again <clears throat> and is able to continue to invest in tools and things that make him more productive and not only benefit him, but may benefit even his companions as well. He could, they could trade fish with him for nets that he produces for them. Now they're more productive. <clears throat> and so without a supply of savings or capital, an economy literally cannot grow. It's not the shifting of money around. It's not spending. It's not stimulus that grows an economy. It's a pool of savings, capital, work, production, investment, sacrifice in the present, sacrifice in the past that we benefit from now in the present, sacrifice in the present toward the future that creates this cycle of growth. The first step that starts with is saving. There's self-discipline, there's saving, there's low time preference, there's willingness to give up in the present in order to get more in the future. Then the, that causes an investment in capital goods, the tools, the machines, the stuff that makes stuff, that makes people more productive, that makes you more efficient, that helps you do your job. Think the carrot harvester and to save, to invest in that machine, that was a capital good, but that made him more productive, saved him time, labor, energy, resources, made him more money. He could plow more crops uh, at less cost. He could drive down his cost and, and even drive down his prices. This causes more savings potentially for someone engaged in that, which now they can invest in, in more of these things, making them even more productive. And the cycle can continue to produce uh, <clears throat> what were and are, what we experience today, unprecedented and unthinkable amounts of material wealth and prosperity, not just for the super wealthy, the rich, the politically well-connected, but for everybody. This is why the American economy can go from, uh, or the Western economy uh, can go from, $3 a day as the norm of human history up to $130 a day as the norm of our consumption. And our relative wealth have, has increased exponentially and it's an unprecedented time because of this cycle of growth. 